I'm Leila Santiago. I'm a correspondent with CNN covering Latin America. Very, very excited to be here with uh, Chef Jose Andres. Uh, as we're watching that video, you know, they, there are so many things that you are a part of. From a, a young boy in Spain, you went uh, into what is being called um, an internationally recognized culinary innovator, a best-selling author, an educator, a television personality, a humanitarian, an owner think group, a pioneer. You're here for Google, so that means you're a global thinker. How do you see yourself? How do you define yourself? I don't know who came up with all of that, but <laughs> um, uh, I am a cook. You're a cook. Mm -hmm. uh, and a very good one. Well, a good one. If you ask my daughters, they, they gave me, you know, fingers Please down for breakfast daughters. the other day. <laughs> they're, they're, but you know, I always say I, feed, I love to feed the few. I have a restaurant with only 12 seats, uh, 30 cooks in the kitchen. There we, we, we push the boundaries of, of, of cooking. But uh, I'm also in love of feeding the many. It's almost a destiny we cannot escape. Mm. If you know you can feed the few, but also you can feed the many, and you don't do it in times of need, I feel that feeding the few doesn't serve the purpose itself. You talk about times of need. Uh, the two of us were in uh, Puerto Rico in September of last year. Certainly, I don't know if you would say it feels like it's been that long, but, um, and you really did feed the needy. And it, we saw devastation, we saw desperation, we saw destruction in a way uh, we've never seen on that island and certainly in a way we've never seen before. How were you, as if it's not impressive enough, that you went without a formal relief program, as if it's not enough that you set up 900 distribution points for food. Why is it that you were able to accomplish what others couldn't? Well, um, you know, we, we came, uh, we were coming back from Houston. Mm. I went there with a team and we began making meals. We took with us over 120,000 pounds of food. We were able to help in two, three kitchens. We helped make thousands, hundreds of thousands of meals. I was coming back uh, to DC and uh, thereafter, Maria is up on the Water Channel. And I'm like, oof, that's gonna be a bad one. And when I saw that Maria was going to hit Puerto Rico directly, uh, my wife doesn't say anything anymore. Yeah, she, she does my backpack and she puts my <laughs> my fishing gear, as she calls it. And as soon as I got on a plane, I, I went there with a friend of mine called Nate Mook. When we arrived, I told my wife I'll leave for four days. I'll come back by the weekend, I'll make sure I leave some money around. I help some friends. We help establish a kitchen. We feed few people, and we go. But then it was Thursday night that I got a visit from the top guy of the Salvation Army. By then, we were already doing six, 7,000 meals a day six days after the hurricane. Mm. And he asked me for food. In that moment, I asked him, where are your kitchens? You are the Salvation Army. I said, well, we are. We're thinking about what's the situation. I said, but where are your kitchens? What are you going to do? That night, I, uh, that night, I knew we were about to have a problem. When I go to the next day to FEMA headquarters, which they invite me, I don't know why, uh, I listen to everybody who is in charge of feeding the island. And the word food was never mentioned for an hour meeting. And at the end, they uh, tell me, hey, Jose, can you tell us what you're doing? And I asked the Red Cross representative, I mm -hmm. say, where are your kitchens? They say, we don't have kitchens. Where are your distribution trucks to deliver food across the island? They say, we don't have them. That moment, I called my wife and I told her, I'm not coming back home. So we went from one kitchen to 26 kitchens in the perimeter of the island and inside. We went from 20 cooks the first day to 25,000 volunteers. We went from 1,000 meals the first day to more than 3.7 million meals a day. At the end, we saw a problem. People were hungry, and nobody seemed to have a plan. So sometimes big problems have very simple solutions. A cook, the solution is start cooking and start feeding. Sometimes taking a very simple step 
you can find a solution to some of the biggest problems that surround us. Right, but this... <laughs> While I appreciate the simplicity of that, the reality of Puerto Rico was um, no power, no water, no cell phone service, uh, no internet, roads closed. I, I, I really do appreciate the simplicity of, of you know, m taking one step, but how did you manage those logistics with such overwhelming challenges? Um, again, uh, cooks, we love to behave. Uh, in a kitchen, it's total chaos. It's like the university. The universe is chaos. We, we behave very well in chaos. Chaos is when we feel at our best. That was chaos. And what we tried to do just was organize it. Everybody began saying, there's no food in the island. Mm. Of sure was food in the island. Everybody was telling me, wow, you're a genius. You were able to, to come up with food in the island. I'm like, sure, I had a credit card. And I, had, and I fill up a line of credit. Mm. And in America, if you have a credit card and you sign a line of credit, you can achieve anything. We were able used to start buying whatever food was available in the island. We began getting generators, we began getting gas, we began getting fuel, we began having a plan, we began developing a map, we began seeing where there was need. Every phone call we got, we never said no. We began feeding the hospitals, we began feeding the elderly homes, we kept receiving more phone calls, mm -hmm. we kept feeding more people. We went from one kitchen to two, to two to four. Why? Because the need was there. It's almost like a business. I am in the business of feeding people. So we were trying to respond to every single call without realizing, yes, it became a very big um, kind of enterprise itself. Mm -hmm. um, at one moment, I was spending over a quarter million uh, uh, dollars a day. Uh, one day, we spent half a million dollars a day, and at that moment, I still, I didn't know where the money was going to come from. But if I will be waiting for the money, people will be going hungry. It was a moment I couldn't afford people going hungry. I don't know why we took it on our shoulders, but I saw that the problem was clear and that we were there for a reason. I never looked back. Just we began cooking and we kept going forward. Mm -hmm. At the end, the money arrived. But like any private business, first you believe in an idea. You put the idea up and running. Then you will see who the investors are to help you pay to that idea to move forward. But we did like the private sector will do. Just we began doing what we do best, which is we believe in this idea. We have to try to feed everybody. Let's go for it. You talk a lot about the logistics, even using social media uh, in your book, which just came out. Congratulations. We fed an island, New York Times bestselling. Um, what, what would you say was the the greatest sort of driving force for you and the volunteers beyond people need to eat. I mean, you know, it, it, was, it was a lot. Uh, I think it was Winston Churchill that said that success is going from failure to failure without using enthusiasm. What we had was enthusiasm. Um, many of the people who were helping us lost their homes. Some people still they didn't know where their family members were. But the enthusiasm was very much the driving force that kept us going. Mm -hmm. We had failures in the process. I wish we fed more people. I wish that I had a better relationship with FEMA, FEMA, that they don't like me very much still today. And I will be able to do more than what we did. I wish we were able to activate the catering company in the airport that could be making quarter million meals a day. I kept knocking on the door. Come on, let's do this catering company. It's easy, it's low hanging fruit. Instead, FEMA decided to try to bring food from Georgia, a company of two people, where they asked them for 35 million meals, $140 million so-called contract. You know how many meals made it into Puerto Rico? Zero. When you had all the assets in the island, what you have to do sometimes, when the recipe doesn't work, just change the name of the recipe itself. What we did when we needed bread, I didn't make a phone call to bring bread from Miami. I found a baker in the island. We helped the owner to get a generator. We helped, we helped him with gas and fuel. In 24 hours, we got bread to make our sandwiches, but then bread to start feeding the island. Mm -hmm. You see, 
very simple solutions to what it seems sometimes very big problems. What did you learn about people in crisis? People in crisis are unbelievable. I do believe that one of the reasons I love to go is because the best of humanity shows up in those moments. Um, I will see this young girl, Lola, 10 year old. Her mother and father work in the food truck division we had. We had 10 food trucks going uh, to different neighborhoods every day, in the morning and the PM. And Lola will stay behind in one of the main kitchens at El Choli, the main mm -hmm. uh, stadium in, in, in downtown San Juan. And Lola will be in charge of the sandwich line. That sandwich line at one point was making around 20,000 sandwiches a day. You had to see a 10-year-old <laughs> telling 200 volunteers, come on, people, come on, people are hungry. More ham, more cheese, more. What I learned is that sometimes the best of people shows up. Yeah. Used to watch a 10-year-old being able to be leading an army of 200 volunteers making sandwiches, knowing at that moment that was important for her, for her to be leading. Mm -hmm. Not just as a child helping, but as a person making sure that we were going to be successful mm -hmm. in the production of, of, of those sandwiches. That's what fills me up. Yeah. And I do believe that's what I, sometimes people thank me I go to those things, but uh, I'm, I'm, I get so much back. Yeah. I come back always re-energized. I come back believing that humanity, all together with the people, we can achieve anything when we're together working towards one goal. I'm curious, do you know how Lola is today? Uh, yeah, I think she's about to become, yeah, 12th, 13th. Yeah, yeah. And I love her. She's like a sister now. Yeah. And, um, and the work she did was amazing. And was not the only one. Yeah. Every, we were de delivering food in more than 900 places a day, 900 locations. We didn't really cook. What we did was create a distribution system. We would use the Navy to deliver to Vieques mm -hmm. and Culebra. We would use the Army to cross rivers without bridges. We would use the Air Force to help us sometimes with an airlift to top mountains that had no easy access. At the end, what we really developed was not the cooking. Cooking for a chef, quite frankly, it's easy. And if you give us the challenge to feed many people, it's like, OK, let's take on the challenge. But I learned that we really did was creating the mechanisms of distribution, gathering intelligence, that then allow us to be successful. By Thanksgiving, we knew so much what was going on on the island. We knew who needed generators. We needed who, knew, who needed blue tarps. Mm -hmm. We inhalers. knew who needed there was an special inhalers, who needed medicines. And we began not only bringing food one home at a time, but with the intelligence we were able to gather, we were able to be covering the needs of many people across the island. What resources do you wish you would have had in the moment? You've, you've kind of gone over the fact that you've learned lessons like any leader yeah. does, but what do you wish? Well, you World Central Kitchen, uh, like this last year, has been like busy. Again, we began, we were an NGO with two people, and now we are four on payroll only. But this, we've been in the fires in Ventura, in the volcano in Hawaii. We've been in, in the volcano in Guatemala. Right now, we have two teams in Indonesia, in Palu. We are right now, we came from North Carolina. Right now we are in Mexico Beach and Panama City. And I learned that we don't like hardware. We like software. Because if I have kitchens and I need to bring them with me, something is going to happen to them and it's going to take me forever. So we send the teams and we try to adapt. And we try to find the kitchens. And we try to activate those kitchens. But one thing that really helps us a lot is to start developing maps. Maps that in real time, I can be showing you where the kitchen that are producing are. Almost like it was an Uber Eats that you pay, place the phone call, hey, I need 2,000 meals right here in this neighborhood. And we start having in these active maps little dots that start blinking. Blinking is these people are hungry. We need to deliver. We have customers. And then all of a sudden, we have hundreds of blinking lights. And we start connecting the kitchens with the with the closest blinking light. So we know that, and all of a sudden you see something moving. Those are the cars that we know in every moment where the car is going, how far away it is. Do we need to call police so police can help us with a score to make it quicker? All of a sudden, these kind of maps that give us the power in real time to be covering the needs of first responders, 
National Guard if they're in need of a meal, neighborhoods, shelters, people that they are in the heart of a mountain where nobody has shown up yet for weeks later. If that's what we are in the process, to develop in those real time maps where everybody is gonna be, feeding, be fed quick, fast, by the minute, not any different than in my restaurant. If in my restaurant any of you takes 10 minutes to receive their salad, you go to Yelp and you start writing a bad review. We shouldn't be treating Americans or anybody else on emergencies any different than the way I feed them in my restaurant. So those active maps, real time, knowing what's going on is what we need. Right now, it doesn't exist. We are in the process of trying to make it work that and way. And you think that can be applied to any disaster, be it hurricanes, wildfires, volcano? I mean, is that sort of the umbrella that all disasters? So one of the things happened in Puerto Rico, a doctor came at 1 a.m. to my, my door in my hotel and knocked on the door. And I was like, hey, how are you? He was from Spain, he knew me, he found my room. And he said, Jose, I need your help. I'm like, you need food tomorrow. I'm like, no, no, I need medicine for transplant. He was the only doctor in the entire Caribbean doing transplants. And for a month, he placed an order to try to get those medicines that were vital to maintain those people alive. Nothing was happening. Uh, I was, he contacted me because he saw in a tweet that I'm a friend of Paul Farmer, one hero of mine, mm -hmm. from Partners in Health, Harvard professor, a legend. I pick up the phone, I call Paul Farmer, I call other people, uh, uh, George Washington Hospital, et cetera. Within three days, we were able to get that medicine that it took him a month to go. On the island? What in the island? Through the private plane of somebody. You shouldn't need a chef that happens no other people to try to get those things. We should be having a simple emergency pharmacy for emergencies, where the donors and the receivers know where everybody is where every single medication, especially the, the very specialty ones, everybody said, where, where are they? Who has them? Who is requesting them? And who can donate them? Mm -hmm. Something like this doesn't really exist today. So in Puerto Rico, when we saw 3,000 people dead, in part was because many of those systems were not in place. Mm -hmm. Many of those systems broke. If you had generators and you had people on breathing machines, why we were not distributing those generators strategically one by one? By not having a good delivery distribution system, people die waiting for electricity, waiting for a generator that sometimes was, a, was available in the island, but nobody had the systems to be delivering. In emergencies, distribution has to be really a very important factor, and we need to do better to have a better distribution channels in emergencies, not only for food and water, but very much for anything else that the population needs. You bring up the deaths after Hurricane Maria. And if you look at the studies after Hurricane Katrina, you will see that the most vulnerable were elderly men. George Washington University just did the same thing. You see that the most vulnerable were elderly men. I get the impression that some things just aren't changing. As someone who's in the thick of it, leading sort of missions, do you think we're learning from our disasters? Unfortunately, I, I don't think we are learning because the, the stories keep repeating themselves. Seems to me that before election day, usually we have better response than non-election year. It's almost becoming a political thing, which shouldn't be a political thing. If I ask every senator and congressman, should every single American have the right in, in an emergency to be having a humble plate of food, a bottle of water, basic needs that gives them hope of a better tomorrow, it shouldn't ever be political. I think the issue is complicated. Everything is run by FEMA. But sometimes the weight of the task is so big. We've been talking about artificial intelligence. Instead of trying to get artificial intelligence on robots, we should be thinking about getting the microchips where every single response is there, and we should be getting it inside our brain so our brains can function quicker and faster. The problem is so big that we are not adapting with very simple solutions to the task ahead. I just came back from Mexico Beach and Panama City. How do you expect police and fire departments and first responders to be communicating when the entire telephone grid goes down and even the radio that needs towers 
don't work. It's impossible that you will be ever efficient. It's too much to ask that America, the most powerful country in the history of mankind, will have those systems in place so we can respond to emergencies faster and quicker. I will believe everybody will agree with me that on that sense, we can do better. Still, I remember in Puerto Rico, in the middle of nowhere, uh, I got a flat tire, I needed it, but the phone still was not working. But all of a sudden, I see as the moon was coming up, I see this kind of very luminous, shiny balloons, look alike planets, and all of the sudden was the, the, the Google kind of cell signal connectors that all of a sudden I got signal and save me from that. It's a lot of solutions out there. We need, um, I should be expecting from FEMA to organize themselves to really give face value to the word emergency. Mm. Right now, to me, it's a federal management agency. To be a true emergency agency, we need to have the, the, a big mindset change. Mm. The urgency of now is now. When it's about food and water, we cannot be negotiating contracts to feed Americans a month from now. Food and water is now, today, in this minute. Anything less, we are failing the American people. Uh, we'll take some questions if anyone has some, but whilst you know, folks get up to the mic if they're interested, I do wanna ask, you've learned a lot about emergency management, you've learned a lot about leadership, food, et cetera. What advice do you have for someone who just wants to make a difference in their community? What have you learned that could sort of be expanded to someone who says, hey, I see a problem, I want to fix it? What advice do you have? Uh, everybody has a talent that they can put to the service of the betterment um, of their fellow citizens. Um, but we need to start changing the conversation about the meaning of helping others, of charity. Uh, Robert Egger, a hero of mine, a guy I've been with more than 25 years, he founded DC Central Kitchen in Washington and LA Kitchen in Los Angeles. And anyway, it's a great model, feeding homeless, but uh, training them to be cooks, uh, then feeding communities, making sure food waste is used for common good. Um, Robert Egger said something very amazing. He said, charity seems is always about the redemption of the giver when charity should be about the liberation of the receiver. If we don't start applying that beautiful, amazing phrase, we feel good by giving. We feel good by trying to change things. But we are really, really feeling good. We sometimes don't ask others, what I'm doing is really helping you get forward. We need to start seeing charity in a way, the same way we invest our money in a startups or in Wall Street, where we expect a return on the investment that is a tangible. With NGOs of the world, we need to start asking, what is the return on the investment with my donation? We need to start seeing things that way, to stop throwing money at the problem and start investing into solutions. In Haiti, we had a place where I cannot call it an orphanage by Partners in Health, where our children that they were uh, um, um, you know, orphans, but children that they got a lot of uh, uh, issues, well, uh, um, um, uh, physical issues, they will never be able to be living that orphanage. Uh, learning disabilities, so they needed money to keep maintaining the, the shelter. I can keep throwing money and maintain the, the orphanage. Or in my case, I'm a private sector guy, we open a bakery, uh, handicap ready, we open a restaurant, not only the bakery to feed the children, which we do, but the bakery to sell the bread outside. All of a sudden, the children, when they grow up, they will learn a business, they will learn a profession, they will be part of the solution, the children will be fed. All of a sudden, they will learn the profession, all of a sudden, we will sell the bread. All of a sudden, we are generating income. This is investing into solutions instead of keep throwing money at the problem. You gotta think big. Um, yeah, <laughs> and especially of offending hunger and poverty in the world. Yeah. I think everybody should be big thinkers and even pretentious because we need bold ideas to make sure that the problem becomes an opportunity. 
we can end hunger and poverty in this planet, but we need to have both ideas, and we have to really do it with love, with empathy, and making sure that happens only sometimes serving a plate of food at a time. Chef Jose Andres, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.